Hello, I'm Justin Caravalias, Consignment Director for Action Figures and Toys here at Heritage Auctions. And today we're going to be discussing our upcoming auction for what I consider to be pieces of toy history. Masters of the Universe was first released in 1982 and is one of the largest toy franchises from the 80s. On December 17th, Heritage Auctions is auctioning 51 lots of original artwork, photographs, blueprints, and more from the collection of John Hollis, one of the designers who worked on the original line. Today, we're happy to be joined by Joe Teague, also known as Motu Joe. He's an avid Masters of the Universe collector and very active in the Masters of the Universe community. He has a Facebook page and YouTube channel, and he's also the co-owner of Mock Masters, a company that provides protective clamshells for action figures. Joe will be leading our discussion with John Hollis, who also joins us today. Uh, John is an inventor, artist, and toy designer who has been in the toy industry since 1978, working for major toy manufacturers such as Mattel, Hasbro, Galoob, and Spin Master, as well as consulting for his own design firm. As a consultant for Mattel in 1985, he had a significant role in the development of the Eternia playset, as well as several Mass of the Universe figures. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much, Justin, for having us on. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks, Justin. So, John, um, I may know a little bit about some of your history, but I don't think many people do. So tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you know, so the fans understand how John Hollis came to be. Sure. Sounds good. Um, like Justin says, uh, I've been in it for a long time in toys. Um, it started out for me uh, in school in illustration, and I worked my way through school in illustration uh, through a pop-up book company. I worked there. That then led me to work for a um, freelance industrial designer who did mostly toys. And so that was my introduction to toys. While I was there working with him, uh, I got a taste for that. This was in California. And uh, right down the road was Mattel Toys. And I saw the Masters of the Universe line and was really excited about it. So I pursued it. And I put together some uh, presentation pieces and stuff, portfolio specifically tailored for uh, Masters of the Universe, showed it there, and ultimately was brought in to do the Eternia uh, playset. And uh, it <laughs> that was my first big taste of toys. So, so you, you kind of pop up book transitioned into this toy opportunity and was it just that easy to get into Mattel with her polio shot or was it a couple tries? Did it like, how did that, it just seems almost fantastical that you just whoop, were in there, right? It, it, you know, it seemed like that at the time too, Joe, <laughs> it was kind of a fantasy come true. Um, you know, young and, and enthusiastic, now I'm old and enthusiastic, but young and enthusiastic carried me a long ways. And I was really excited about what they were doing over there. And I thought, you know, I don't stand a chance, but I'm going to give it a try anyway. And so when I put together uh, a demo figure, as it were, I sculpted it out, designed it, had some features on it, uh, had a, a tail flip feature that would throw a foam rock over his shoulder at the bad guys. And uh, he had a uh, iron fist that was on a spring. And uh, I showed that first time to prelim department, preliminary design department. And they said, yeah, this is really cool. They took it inside looked at it, um, said, yep, really neat, but we don't really have need for that quite yet, um, but we'll keep you in mind. Well, many months later, I got a call from design department, not prelim, um, who had seen the portfolio too. And that was Charlie McCoes in design department. And he said, we have this upcoming big play set and we're way behind in terms of time and we could really use your work. Uh, we've seen your portfolio. This is exactly the type of stuff we do. And it took off from there. That's awesome. That's it's such well. a great, I mean, it's, yeah. And here we are talking, you know, 30, 40 years later about this amazing project. So you, you mentioned Eternia. That's kind of what brought you in. McCombs, you know, saw that opportunity for you and said, hey, let's get John in here. What else did you work on while you were at Mattel? Was it just Eternia? Were there some other pieces, some key things that uh, Masters of the Universe fans would want to know about? Yeah, the um, it was primarily Masters of the Universe. That was really, I was brought in for Eternia. Um, let me think here. The very, very first things that I was giving given were uh, doing some color studies for the deco on Tongue Lasher and Rattler. And they had already been designed, but they didn't have the color schemes yet. So that was the very first stuff I did. 
which was kind of just, you know, killing the first week, trying to get the paperwork done and et cetera, which was fun. And I, and I did that. And uh, that was really cool stuff. Then I started doing some accessories for both of them and uh, designing those. And then the big one hit and they started showing me the stuff that they had from prelim and marketing on uh, what they then started calling Eternia. And um, then the rest of it basically was that until I finished that off. And then I did a couple other figures within the line. Uh, and then I got married and uh, went to Europe on honeymoon with my wife. <laughs> That's great. So there's there's several pieces that that fans are going to get to see throughout this collection. And, you know, uh, you mentioned color study. I can tease a little bit of what we're going to see. There are some color studies that we're going to show today. Um, but you mentioned Macomb as well. So were there some other very key names and people within uh, Mattel that some of the fans mm -hmm. that you work with directly would like to know? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, Charlie McCombs, actually. Charlie oh, I'm sorry. I said McCombs, didn't I? My, my apologies. Totally fine. Um, Charlie was an amazing person, and I say was because he passed away in 21. Um, I did not know it at the time, but he had come from uh, Ford, actually, and he was a designer at Ford, and he did the Mustang GT500. I mean, did as in, yeah, that was his design, and I didn't even know that at the time. And he was just this nice, quiet guy, very uh, conscientious, would always, you know, be right on time and get everything done, and he was the best boss to possibly have for me because I was not good with time. I was totally enthusiastic. Uh, I would work till midnight there and have the, the I had, had to go over to security many times to get them to turn the lights back on because they'd automatically go off. Uh, but I would then roll in at about maybe 8.30 or 9, but everyone else was there at 8 o'clock sharp. And they go, oh, yeah, he's not going to last. You know, John's not going to laugh. Oh, this is not good. Charlie protected me from that because he saw the stuff that I was doing. He'd come in, he'd look at the stuff on my desk, and he'd go, ooh, there's a lot of stuff here. And half of it would be gone when I got in the next morning because he'd have already picked it up and, and used it and stuff. So he protected me from that. And he ran interference, as it were, from all of the uh, marketing and uh, politics and et cetera, and just let me do my job. And it was wonderful. He was a great guy. Um, another fellow in between us was Martin Areola. And oh, he also wow. was great. Martin's, yeah, Martin's great. Always had a great patois. Uh, he was just funny and he was a really good manager. And he was the guy who basically managed and wow. gave me daily direction on attorney and, and basically all of the stuff that I did there. Wow. That, that, that's a, it's a <laughs> well, for those that, that don't know, that those are two very key people there. Uh, and I, I know a lot of the figures and fans know Martin's name. And it's just great that you guys got to work together. And speaking of some of these pieces of work, maybe we should show some of the fans of what's coming up in these lots and come these, some of these auctions that Heritage is going to be putting up. Maybe we'll put the first one up now and talk a little bit about it. Ah, good. Yes, that, that is Rio Blast, right? This is a, yeah. you know, it, there's there's fun there's fun conversations when we start looking at pieces like this in the process. And tell tell the fans a little bit about the process as yeah. to what we're looking at here. And I, I'm going to foreshadow just a little bit. There will be color studies of Rio Blast that we're going to get to in a minute. But explain how you get to this right here that we're looking at. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That's a that's a great introduction to the working process there at Mattel. Um, the layers, as it were, or the sequence is generally uh, an idea or a slot is defined by marketing. They say, gee, we need a figure and uh, we want it to be generally in this theme. In this case, they gave a generalized um, cyborg cowboy, I think is what they said. We want something that fits the slot of cyborg cowboy. What would that be? Normally, then, that direction would go to prelim department. But uh, Real Blast, this one, came to me kind of late in my, this is after I did Eternia there, basically. And uh, I was 
proven enough. They said, yeah, we trust him. This is good. They just skipped prelim entirely and gave me the direction directly. So um, I did a fair number of variations and sketches and et cetera, and worked it you know, left, right, and sideways. And this is one of them. This is, uh, I believe, one of the earlier ones. Yeah, it's it's it definitely has features on it that are not on the finished Rio Blast product from the stock of the back gun. Yeah. Looks to be more rifle like to yeah. the chest not having a fold on it, you know, where the badge, the, the knee joints on the, the 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 guns on the thighs, they look a little bit different, you know, the there's no mustache, the helmet. I mean, there's it's crazy, but this is it's an amazing piece on the development of Rio Blast. Actually, this is also a good um, example, too, because later in my career, uh, my niche as an inventor was more for features and mechanisms and gestures, uh, things that hadn't been done before. So perhaps unlike a lot of the other designers in Mattel, normally they start with this. They'd start with the drawings. I didn't start with the drawings. I took a figure and hacked them all apart and, and you know, drilled out the chest and glued things onto the uh, onto the arms and the legs and and you know just did a quick and dirty prototype of cheese i wonder cyborg maybe you know maybe i want them to have just an insane amount of guns popping out and stuff where would they go and uh, came up with a backpack mechanism and it was literally you know scraps of plastic and uh you know bu bubblegum and bailing wire as they say just anything and everything taped it together and you know foam core and this and hot, hot melt glue and figured it out and then gave it to uh, the model making department, which is like 20 steps over from where I was. And uh, they then tightened it up and made another one, but I knew what I was doing. And what that allowed us to do was then show that model, which the model maker had made of, oh yeah, this is what it's gonna, you know, it's gonna flip out and it's gonna do all these cool things. And we'll show you what it looks like later when John gets the drawings done. So. <laughs> This is That's actually crazy. Step, this is actually step two for me uh, uh, on the drawings. And so, so there's, so this is this is good to transition because we're talking about drawings, and I tease the color studies. I believe the next uh, item is one of the, the a color study. There we go. And you know, the last one was a graph paper, true pencil drawing, a uh, hundred percent like freehand type of a thing while well, this particular talk about this one a little bit on the color study and, and how we're starting to see a, a different style ahead uh, and kind of getting a little closer to the, the the final yep yeah yeah exactly uh i believe can't quite see it there's definitely marker in this uh i think it's not on graph paper the style by the way i should back up again on the the process um you know, we are all familiar with the features on a computer of cut and paste. Uh, that's what we, those features came from literally cutting and pasting and copying. We had this really great big uh, Canon copier and we used it constantly because it had this phenomenal new feature where you could actually change the scale. It was kind of amazing for the times. And the so things we take for granted today. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, you know, cutting edge technology, while well, you could actually change the scale on the copy. So we do a drawing on anything, you know, graph, graph paper or tissue paper a lot. Why tissue paper? Because you could then lay it over something else or lay something else over it and redraw and trace and back and forth and then get one of those and copy it a bunch of times. Why a bunch? Because you want to do some other variations and then draw over the top of that. And that, I believe is what this one is. It's possible that this is a, let me think here. Yeah, I think this is actually tissue paper laid over the top of, probably vellum laid over the top of one of those other drawings and then markers, which was also a, a common thing. The head without a helmet on this, uh, at one point we had a mustache too, but anyway, yes. uh, taking, the, taking the helmet off, I, I clearly remember was Martin's call and it was like, yeah, Suddenly it starts to starts to make a little bit of sense. This is good. Uh, we tried a cowboy hat at one point, but uh, basically it wouldn't fit in the package. And um, we said, yeah, you know, we don't really need that. That's fine. So we skipped that. But yeah, some of the details are starting to come in here. And this is just a color study. 
So this is actually a, a, a very good transition into yet the next item because what you just described is physically visible in many different iterations with the next auction item. So it's not just a single color study of Rio Blast. It's a multiple color study of Rio Blast. Yeah, this is yeah, this is good. Um, what do we got here? Let's go through some of them. these. All seem to be fairly early uh, in the design part. Uh, I, as I say, I had already defined that there was going to be flip out arm guns and thigh guns from the chaps. There we go. That's that's one on the bottom. Actually, can, yeah, good. Can you zoom in on that guy? Thank you. That's good. Right. Okay. So that's basically the underdrawing. I said, well, if he looks like this, what would some colors be? And that's what some of the other ones are. And then other details, I think, also have been changed in some of the other ones. So yeah, this is a good representation. It uh, it kind of shows how the working process works. Yeah. What I what I really liked is, in particular, you've got you know, on the, the, these versions that are currently on screen are the rotating out pistols on the forearms. But if we scroll up to the top gun on the far right or left, I'm sorry, yeah, that's yeah. a flip out style. That's an early different right. style where it's not a pin. It's a true flip out, you know, and actually, so, yeah. Also on that, sorry to interrupt there, Joe, yeah, but no. also on that notice that um, there is a, right-handed gunslinger low on the thigh pistol sculpted in also on that yes one, which did not get into the final because he had the gun in his thigh in the uh in the final he said yeah it's too much yeah and it, it almost looks like this version has a mustache helmet if that makes sense too yeah there we go that's right yeah yeah so he may not have had a mustache under there could have just been a helmet mustache yeah the, so Later, um, uh, there's also uh, drawings that I did uh, that were quite detailed on the backpack and the gun and the details and stuff. So it kind of went through the same iteration process of, gee, I wonder if it looks like this. How about if it looks like that and et cetera. So it wasn't just the figure. It then also is all of the accessories that go with them. In this case, the accessories were pretty much built into and on him. Yeah, this 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 particular lot really... I think exemplifies the different iterations, the process, the whole kind of what you just explained in one in one shot. It's a, I think it's an amazing, beautiful piece and representative of the process. I think it's yeah, great. yeah, I agree. It's, it's a good set. So speaking of process, there's a whole other process that you go through when it comes to play sets, um, similar but different in regards to manufacturing and. Some of those is the next piece that's coming up was one of the favorite, my favorite pieces out of your whole, the whole John Hollis collection was the snake tower concept struts and this, this particular item. It is a single sheet that tells so many different stories on the, what was going on in your head and what could have been and how it wound up finishing. It's just, I love this piece. It was. It still is one of my favorite pieces in the whole collection. That's that's really cool. You picked that out and are excited about that. I, I have to say that thumbnails. That's what this is. It's a thumbnail page, meaning that, you know each each one of the the drawings is small, uh, size of a thumbnail. Actually, they're larger. But that's the idea. Is you're not going for detail. You just want to get a bunch of ideas down quickly. So that's that's what a thumbnail page is. And this is that. Generally speaking people don't really respond to thumbnail pages. They're just kind of a personal log for the person who's doing the designing. This is very, as I say, it's very personal. This is really never meant for anyone else to see. This is just me. And it's very gratifying to have you look at that and get it and understand what it is. The direction on uh, Eternia started out as pretty simple. Um, it was a big play set. They had a big budget for it. It actually came, I was told, the budget uh, for tooling came out of advertising, which was rare. Uh, so they had a good advertising, excuse me, a good uh, tooling budget out of the deal. And so we had a lot to work with. It was going to be big. 
and the original prelim uh, design and drawing for yeah here's a playset had a monorail it had what turned out to be the uh, you know the flip arm uh, mechanism in the front which made it all the way through into the final and it had to fit the uh, freight fighter I think it was called the dragonfly vehicle uh, had to be able to land on it and that was basically all they had they didn't have three towers at the time it had two and you know, something over to the right. And they said, gee, we need a third tower. What would it be? And that's what this page is, is going, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's a tree. Uh, maybe it's a cauldron. Maybe it's a coil of snakes. Maybe it's, you know, et cetera. And so that's what this page is. It's the right hand ended up being snake uh, tower. Yeah, I love the, the names that you've got on some of them. The, the very bottom right one just says claw. Yeah. And you can, you can see it. It can totally see. I mean, it's not snake. It's, but it's a, this claw thing. And I can totally envision that have being an actual thing, you know, it fits, but that's not what came to life. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot to choose from. Yeah. I, so, I, I, can jump in. I yeah, one of the things I like is the, uh, the Medusa head that's in the middle of that. Um, it just says Medusa underneath. You can't really tell what it is, but I can yeah. only imagine the snakes coming out of the head and, uh, you know, some of those snakes grabbing the monorail as it goes around. That's, uh, you know, that, that that's a concept that I'd be interested to, you know, that, that'd be really cool to flush out. Um, that's, if, if you were marketing, you'd go, hey, John, let's do that. Yeah, probably. And, and I do want to jump back to one thing because you mentioned it and we all know what tooling is. Um, but just a step back for a second to people who might not know what tooling is and what that means. And were you talking about budget? You know, maybe if you want to explain that just a little bit too. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. that's good. It's a good point. It's not obvious stuff. So uh, skipping backwards a bit when I said there's, you know, the the series and the, the uh, hierarchy, I guess it was, of uh, how the thing gets developed. It starts with a kind of a call to entry. This is, you know, marketing says, gee, we need something in this price point about this size uh, we, we, in this case, needs to be a play set. We want a couple of these features in it. And you have a big budget. Ooh, neat. So it then generally goes to prelim. They do a drawing. Then it goes to what I ended up being in design, which is, okay, now we have this vague idea, but what's it really going to look like? And so then design department, in this case, me, figures out, okay, this is what it looks like. It also has to be interfaced with, yeah, I could design something but you have to be able to make it and cost effectively. So making it, what does what making it mean? Well, tooling literally means a mold. And uh, there are generally steel molds that you squeeze the hot plastic into and they actually make the final piece. Well, that's a complicated process, turns out. And you really have to know all of the variations of what you can and can't do. Uh, and so the designer has to work with the engineers to figure out, quote, the tooling. And um, that's what the interface is that you're talking about, Justin. Uh, tooling means the things that actually squeeze out the final piece of plastic that you end up buying. Yeah, but it's very expensive and one of the most, you know, time consuming, one, one of the, you know, key parts to, you know, obviously right. the molds are where everything comes from. So it has to be a very exact process. So I just, you know, the, the, the yep. tooling and, and the expense of that being absorbed by marketing is actually something interesting. I you know, that that's incredibly unusual, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, that, again, you know, I can't confirm that that's actually what happened, but that was the story I was told at the time. So it was like, Ooh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that's a, a background on that too. Um, toy industry and specifically Mattel, but you know, large companies, toy industry, very price sensitive, price sensitive, uh, and margins, meaning, you know, how much profit they make. So on some of the Rio Blast, for example, and we're figuring out the decos and stuff, well, I can't go wild there and just put, you know, chrome vacuum metalizing over here and these other, you know, 27 decos on his left arm because it costs money. So we were down to, you know, like a quarter of a penny on a lot of those things and shaving them down. So to get a project like Eternia was unheard of for a designer. It was just great. Wow, we've got a budget that's that big? You mean, I don't have to make it that big? I can make it like three feet tall? 
<laughs> no one did that. It was great. That's that's incredible, man. That's that's these are we hear these these stories from the glory days, these eighties of these these big toys, and it's just it's a different process now that stuff can happen, but it's different. And it's really cool to hear, you know, your excitement that you got to do that stuff back then. And we're getting to kind of relive this now. It's, I, I love, I love it. Love it. And to that, so we're, we have, this was the, the, the prelim pictures here, the, the thumbnails for the, the snake tower. I think it's a good segue into one of the next items, uh, which happens to be on screen right now. And again, one of the, it's hard to, to pick your favorite pieces, but we're kind of putting some of the, 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 the real fancy stuff out right now. And there's a whole bunch more too, to be revealed yet. And you guys, this is an epic piece. Absolutely epic piece. To explain a little bit of what, what, what we're seeing here. Obviously it's snake tower. It's, yeah. the front, it's on a tissue paper. What's hard to tell is the size of this. So tell, tell fans what we're looking at a little bit. Yeah, this is also a good choice here. This is really good. Um, the one that you previously showed was the thumbnail, which is the thumbnail page, which was absolutely the very beginning of, well, yeah, thank you, that one. Um, you know, that's very much the roughest of, well, I wonder what it could be. The next one, this one, is the, this is what it's going to look like. And there's a lot of iterations between that and this, but what this represents is uh, what they call the control drawing. And control in this case means that's what it's going to look like in final. And sculptors would follow these drawings. And uh, this is difficult too, because this isn't, you know, like a, a car tire or, uh, you know, or a wheel or something that's very mechanical. This is very organic. So there's a lot of interpretation. So you have, that's what the rendering is about on this, the shading and stuff. Um, and luckily, Mattel also had sculpting department right there on the same floor with us, the designers. So this represents, a, it's a very large drawing. It may even be full, full size one-to-one. -one, I'm not sure, but it's very large. And um, that's given to the sculptor and then they sculpt it in wax. And then they come over and, you know, like, Hey, John, you know, give me a call. And could you come over here and look at this? You know, what about this? And we'd talk about it for a bit and, and rework and, and uh, so this represents the definition of what it finally should look like, the actual one, which actually is very close to uh, the final that you could buy as a turnia. Note also uh, that really what this one is, is focusing on the tower itself. The struts are just kind of, uh, you know, loosely sketched in as in struts go here. Uh, and then likewise, uh, the snake head is a separate piece. So that isn't defining, this drawing isn't defining that so much as the tower itself. And this is, quote, the front of the tower. Uh, you know, you do another back view and a side view. And this little small drawing in here shows that is two shell halves. A, a little drawing off to the right of this. It just shows that there's two halves and that the snake head then rotates around. That's what that, there we go. That's what that is. That's this, again, I remember seeing this for the first time, just being awestruck. It still is, <clears throat> it's amazing. So I do have a question though, if you, re, if, if you recall or not, at this point in the process, the chains, just kind of a super dork question. Were the chains meant to be plastic were they meant to be molded? Were they meant to actually be a physical chain at this stage, or was it undetermined? Yes, um, we went through a couple of iter excuse me iterations on that. Um, we had sourced out, bought a uh, metal chain at one point, and then we had sourced out, bought plastic chain at some point. You know, and I I can't actually remember if that got into the final or not, but nevertheless. Um, it would work with, it wasn't actual structural, it, actually structural. Uh, it was just aesthetic. And uh, again, I don't know if that actually made it into the final or not. Metal metal chains made it into the final. There we go. Okay. So, so that's, that's, cool. and that's where I just was kind of curious because in the drawing, it could be plastic, meaning, and it could even be molded plastic, 
right? Like that could right. have been what the intention was. So I just was curious where, where you guys were at in that process with, with this particular piece. Well, then this is cool. I, you know, it's also very gratifying too, because when I'm talking with you, Joe, stuff exactly like this is cool because you know, I mean, I design it and you know, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's fun. It's definitely fun. So again, this is one of the pieces that is coming up. It's, it's pencil on tissue paper, and it is obviously an incredible detail for the, the base tower uh, for Snake Tower. It's, it's, it's an epic piece. So you talked a little bit about the head up top. Um, let's maybe let's, let's take a look at the next item that's going to also be coming up in the auction because there's really, really, really a lot of cool stuff yet to come. So right. this particular piece is what, what's known as a sipia. But explain to the fans what this piece means in relation to the Scipia, for example. What does that mean? And also, how does this relate to the last piece that we just saw? Yeah, that's great. This also is, um, I'm guaranteed, the same size as the other drawing. And the reason is that this is a contact print. Uh, a sepia or a blueprint um, are contact prints from the vellum. The vellum... Um, was uh, the tissue paper, basically. It's kind of, you know, tracing paper. You can see through it. You do the drawing on that, then that goes, uh, and this is all done in-house, uh, you know, on the same floor that we were at, and you make a one-to-one -one, um, sepia. In this case, it's a brown, although it could have been blue. Um, copy of it so that you don't just have one. You may have two sculptors working on various things, or you may have, geez, marketing, you know, really needs to look at this or that, you know, they're starting to do uh, package art on it and they'd really like to see what the deal details are. So they'd want two or three of these or four or five or six. And so you make a bunch of copies. And so this is what that is. I also note too that the snake head on this one uh, is different. This is uh, likewise just sketched in. Yep, there it is. Not really defined. It's like, uh, and a snake head goes here, which is good. So how this relates to the other one, uh, the drawing, previous drawing, is that it is, there you go. It's the same uh, drawing of the tower. That's the same. But apparently that sepia print was, this one, was done before the other one because I erased this head on the drawing and drew the other head because we had then by then gone from this to the other head uh and def defined that and said yeah okay now we know what the head's going to look like uh, i remember martin said yeah we want something that isn't upward facing so much <coughs> that we threaten the monorail and what's going around the monorail we want something like this it goes down yeah okay good so it's different so that got defined. By the time it got defined, I then went ahead and erased uh, this head and drew in the other one. And then ultimately we would have made blueprints and stuff of that too. That's crazy. It's crazy. There's subtle, subtle differences, but it's, it stems from the same base. And then I, it's the process, right? And basically your entire collection is the process that fans can physically see from multiple different items mm -hmm. from start to near from near like you said from early concept of what ifs to finished product in various capacities and this this stuff does not come around very often it's it's special yeah it is i have to say that the culture at mattel at the time too was you know just get it done which of course makes sense you know everything's always late and it was adds to the excitement, I suppose, too. And consequently, there wasn't any mechanism for saving stuff, development stuff. So a lot of stuff, really interesting stuff, you know, models and, and uh, you know, prelim drawings and stuff, zip, you know, went out the door, fine, gone. So it's kind of, you know, I, I love this stuff. I mean, it was, you know, I was living it and I would just stick it in the folder underneath my desk, you know, and it kept growing and growing and growing. And, um, you know, when I left, I said, you know, gee, could I take this? Yeah, it'd be fine. You know, we're done. So, you know, it's already out there now. So good. So, Amazing. Uh, yeah. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. 
Yeah, exactly. And and here we are today. So yeah, that's right. It, it is uh, very rare to have stuff like that. Uh, you know, one or two does exist. You can find them. They do pop up, but um, yeah, it's it's not every day. It's not expected. No. Um, and so so we'll, we'll transition back into some of the pieces because there is still one more uh, eternity piece that we're going to tease today. And it's another study, but not a color study. It's kind of the snakehead study. And, you know, explain to explain what we're seeing here. Yeah, very good. Okay, well, that dovetails nicely in with um, the last reference to the snakehead. Uh, this also is on tissue paper. Um, very early, you know, just thinking about, gee, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Actually, I, yeah, somewhere in here, I did this with my hand and thought, you know, well, okay. Uh, what? I, so I drew the hand and he said, well, what would the snake head look like if it were the hand, that sort of thing. So, you know, it was all over the place, really loose coming up with ideas. And um, Martin came in and looked at it and said, yeah, I, you know, something along these lines. And he picked the one that's lower right. Uh, that So I put a box around it and um, then started to think about, okay, how do we actually make this? And if you zoom in, you might be able to see what I defined as the, thank you, that's good, uh, the parting line it goes down the center of his head. Well, what that means is that, yeah, you could actually have all those undercuts and you could actually make that shape uh, in a mold. You could actually have the plastic work if you had it in two shell halves. And that's what that is. And it actually is very uh, close to what the final piece of plastic uh, ended up looking like. It is. It's very cool. And it's it's cool to see these. Again, we'll call them the attempts, the what ifs. You know, it's mm -hmm. again, I like the one right next to it. It's got uh, this monstrous uh, type feel to it as well. So, I mean, you were mm -hmm. all over the gamut from a little like garter snake to these monstrous things. It's, it's cool to see. Mm -hmm. So. We've talked a lot about Eternia because it's it's one of the major things. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Eternia because it's an epic toy set and you're one of the key designers for it. So moving on from the snake tower, maybe we'll transition to the next item, which I think fans are going to enjoy quite a bit as well, because it highlights the process yet again, as opposed to the figure like Room 3 Blast that we talked about. Now we're talking about the center tower, the main tower of Eternia. And, you know, elaborate as to what, what, what fans are seeing today. Right. Uh, this also is a good collection in that it does show the process, just like you and Justin were saying. Um, I said earlier, you know, that we had this, ooh, it's a copy machine, a Canon copier. Wow. Uh, well, that's it. So somewhere in here is, I think, a tissue of the original drawing. Although the top center is the original. The white. Okay, good. There we go. Here it is. Great. Uh, yeah, there we go. Perfect. And it shows that uh, there's no tower in there. That's intentional because I am wanting to figure out, well, what does the tower look like? So I just make a bunch of copies of that and then start drawing over the top and filling in, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And that's what this whole collection, this whole canon of drawings is, is exploratory. Uh, what is the center of tower? What's it, what could it look like? Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on here, and I, I know super fans like myself could have a field day with picking it apart, but one of the things that's immediately striking is that that's not a lion. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, Martin, Ari Martin Ariola was uh, – he, he was just one of the funniest guys I've ever met in my life. And uh, he'd come in and say, yeah, you know, we got, got this wolf head sort of thing, but – I don't know, Wolf, Woofy's just not getting it. And so he suddenly, you know, everyone picked up on that and, you know, it's Woofy, you know, okay, fine. Which incidentally was interesting because Dave Wolfram, friend, designer right next to me, uh, we were both in the same little cubicle at the same time, Wolfram had a nickname of Woofy also. So yeah. that was kind of funny. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's right. Um, so it started out, actually, Prelim uh, on their drawing had a wolf head. And so that's really kind of where this came from. 
And um, so we started doing explorations of other possible ones. I remember uh, doing a lot of different variations of, you know, really wild stuff. And uh, obviously we ended up with the one that you know of in the final Eternia, which is not a wolf head. No. And I think, again, I think it's great to see that like you would be given a few criteria. You can clearly see the sweeping arm action is, is here um, at this stage as well. And it looks like you're toying with how am I going to get fight fire to land on top of this through a couple different options as well. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's cool to see this, this knowing the story, hearing it from you and then seeing these things to really put them together is it's, it's wonderful. Cool. Yeah, this um, the actually the center tower grew um, from the very first drawings and what we were given. I can't remember the actual numbers, but we said, well, you know, and the center tower is going to be whatever it was, you know. And then, you know what? We can make it even bigger than that. Really? <laughs> so, OK, we'll do that. That'll be good. So, so by that's, the time that's excellent foreshadowing, but for later. It's still going to be real today, but later. It's yeah, excellent okay. foreshadowing. But let's take a look at the next piece. Uh, again, it's center tower related, but it's it's a little bit different here in that. It, it, again, I want to make sure this is the right piece too. That that this has a couple iterations, like down at the bottom by the feet, we've got blue highlight. Um, expl explain a little bit of what what we see here with these three pieces. Sure, actually, uh, this is good. This is the uh, a tissue. Again, working on tracing paper. Um, it's got blue in there, but um, that doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it doesn't indicate anything specific in this drawing anyway. Uh, all of us pretty much used anything that was on the table. You know, if it was a red pencil or a blue pencil or a marker <laughs> or ink or pencil, you know, graphite pencil, uh, whatever you happen to choose at the time. So then these are, this is good. These are copies. Uh, that then I have done some drawing over the top of, not much, yeah, but some in the edges. Um, and this is then what many times other people would see and they critique and et cetera. But they're, um, it's original and then copies so that we could continue working. Yeah, and what's, what's, what's again, it's difficult to see in one of the copies is brickwork. You uh -huh. penciled in bricks on the copy so it's not just a photocopy there are some legitimate like hey okay just like the other process yeah. here is this and let's see what this looks like can we bring this to fruition and and you can you can see that and mm -hmm. it's those subtle things but they mean a lot to the fans and it's here it's right here it's mm -hmm. so i think it's i think it's a great piece it's a good collection to show how the center tower and again for whoever does win this, this is a, a wolfy, as we'll, we'll call it affectionately, a wolfy center tower. It's not a lion center tower. Right. So it's yeah. it's pretty cool. It's uh it's not the earliest. It's not. It's certainly not the latest. It's about somewhere in the middle of the development process of uh, the center tower. So uh, this is again. It's like maybe this was planned or staged. It's a really good transition or segue into the next item, which. I'm a big fan of because I teased about it just a little bit ago on size. And you were just talking about how, hey, we can go a little bit bigger. Yeah. T tell fans what they see on screen right now. Yeah, this is, this is good. Um, the, the large one, uh, again, is a tissue. It may actually be full size, but probably it isn't because we you know, full size was huge, but it's big. Um, and this is getting close to defining what the um, control drawing is going to be. You notice that uh, we have gone with more of a deco look. It does not have uh, all of the brickwork in it, et cetera. It's, it's a lot cleaner and smoother um, because we reserve the thinking on that was we reserved the, the stone and brickwork for the left tower. And we want it to look quite different. So, okay. And then uh, this has what actually is very close to the final uh, lion head. And that openings yeah. for the arms as well. Like this yeah. is, this is getting close. That's right. 
Absolutely. Yeah. It shows the jaw down, you know, jaw up, jaw down. How might that work? So yeah, this is very close to uh, control drawing. I would guess that final um, rendered shaded in control drawing was done right after this. So this is, this is it. And then the one on the left is the, well, gee, what if we do a cat head instead of some sort? And so that's a, a sketch of, well, maybe it looks like this. And we've got a, we've got a little uh, extra compartment, it looks like, too. Yep. And this is, the, uh, this is the first iteration of, well, maybe we have some compartment in there, which it opens differently, but uh, that did happen on the final, too. It's, it's, it's great to see, again, all of these different iterations, the whole process, and now we're getting pretty much to the final, and it's pretty much to full scale, which mm -hmm. I think for any collector that's a, a Masters fan, everything that we've shown has been spectacular. And it's really hard from a fan standpoint, from my standpoint, to say which is the favorite, but we have some select pieces that I think we're all gravitate towards. I mentioned earlier the tower piece uh, thumbnails I was I was gravitating towards when I first saw the stuff. But the last item we're going to share today is arguably one of the key pieces in the John Hollis collection. And oh, geez, just seeing it's freaking amazing. Um, this is a early drawing of Eternia, and I will let you go from there. Yeah, this is this is interesting to me too. This is exciting to me too. Um, this is one in, in uh, you know like a series. I did uh, a bunch of these. Each one, not uh, it was very roughly drawn. You know, well, let's see, there'd be a tower over here and a tower in the center and something over the right in the moat. Um, but then over the top of that tissue, uh, I would do these. And this one is again just exploratory. You know, gee, what could some features be? Maybe there's a roof section here. The a feature that I really liked was the uh, the gun, which gun thing on the center tower, which uh, was built in and would flip over and allow you to have a, a floor at the top. And it would flip into what would be the, the second floor. <laughs> and that would allow the freight fighter to, uh, to land on it, et cetera. So just playing around with ideas. But... This was very early, you know, first couple weeks, call it, um, very first touches on what might Eternia look like. And um, so I was really grooving on the textures and the sculpting and the drawing and the character and stuff. I hadn't really slowed down enough to figure out exactly how these things were gonna be tooled and et cetera. So I had a lot of freedom, basically. And, uh, and I like working in ink, and that's what this is, this ink over the top of uh, uh, pencil on vellum. So there's, there, there's, there's a lot, lot going on in this that, that doesn't make it into the set. Pretty much none of it makes it into the set. I mean, the monorail, the sweeping arms, and a landing pad. But this is... This is what I affectionately, and I'm not dubbing it this, but I call this Dragon Eternia. Because of that head, looks like a dragon, and its horn comes all the way up and, and mounts as part of the monorail. Mm -hmm. And its mandible-like jaws still do the sweeping action and have that feature built into it as well. It's... It's sinister looking. It has this menacing like, whoa. And I, I, I love it. I love it. You've got, you've got panels that open up on this piece. You've got a flip gun that didn't really happen. You've got a, the, the, the gray skull or the right top, left tower, sorry, has the treasure chest, which doesn't, you know, like this, there's so much going on here. Mm -hmm. Your creativity on what this could have been and as I digress, I don't mean to digress with this, but what I thought was really cool that I just noticed now, not making this up, is in your center tower attempts and the blue sheets, not to go back, you don't need to pull up, pull it back up, 
one of those drawings has that staircase from the what would be Snake Tower coming up to it. I'm like, I didn't quite catch that until we were going through these, but that center tower has this staircase going up. So you were even thinking about that. When, it's just, it's mm -hmm. really cool to see this and then making that connection back to the previous lot. This is epic. That's pretty cool. You know, something, this is neat. Uh, I like going over these too. It's, it's brings me back to that, that uh, enthusiastic time too. The um, two winged harpies, uh, down at the on either side of the staircase in the front, yeah, in the center tower. I noticed that this is a very early drawing, you know, very first couple of weeks, and I had those in it. It those dropped out for most of it, and then they got back in at the very end. Those those actually did make it through. Interestingly enough, that's it's this is I. It's pen. It's an original. It's a what if this is could have been Eternia. I I love it. This is this is a epic, and I, I don't throw that around too loosely. This truly is an epic piece for any Masters of the Universe collection. This is a one of a kind. There's it's it's spectacular. Thank you. Yeah, if I if I could jump in, yeah, you know, I look at this as the the gothic medieval, you know, <laughs> version. And I also look at it, you know, in a different perspective too. Is looking at okay, we we, we go back to the tooling part of it. How many more parts would this have had to have if you went with this from all the intricacies of the, the left tower to, you know, the top of the, the center tower? Um, yeah, I, I, I love the mandibles too. The, you know, the sweeping mandibles is a, you know, a next level thought. The arms are easy, but the mandibles are, are you know, are just that next mm -hmm. level. So, uh, you know, the, the tooling on this and, you know, if you had these all as separate pieces rather than molded in. Um, you know, this, this could be, an, an, you know, it's almost like a, a, a second set. I'd love to see what a production piece like this would look like. Well, we'll, we'll just have to do that for you there, Justin. We'll, we'll make one of these for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love, I would love to say full, full scale, of course. Yeah. Okay. Sounds that's good. Why. Sure. Well, we'll have marketing pay for the tooling. It'll be fine. Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. There you go. <laughs> so th this, I mean, I guess to kind of try to, 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 to bring it back, this is 51 pieces of your work from when you were working at Mattel tied to several different figures, several different uh, attorney of playset and several different figures specifically within the master's line. And all of this is going to be made available uh, through the auction house. And Justin, you want to uh, share a little bit of detail about the auction house and some of how people can get into this so that way they don't miss out uh sure so um you know everything is up on is up live on heritage now you can go there and visit um you can visit ha.com slash 49155 that will get you directly to the main page of the auction everything is live right now so you can go up there and bid the auction ends on uh, December 17th on Sunday. So you can bid up to that point and then it goes into live auction one piece after the other. You can bid live and, and you know, and, and try to acquire your favorite pieces from this. I know there'll be some, you know, robust bidding because this is really only, you know, this is the only time that these pieces specifically will be available. Um, you know, so the, the, and, and I don't know that there's going to be a second opportunity. You know, the, the secondary market is, is nice, but we're only talking about 51 lots here, uh, in, in, in this particular collection. So I think, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, it, it, there's going to be a lot of interest, uh, you know, and, and if you've sit, sat through this whole, you know, th this, th this whole conversation that we've had right now, you're probably one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the fans who needed to know this information. Um, you know, I've sat through many more hours with uh, with John and Joe, and you know, it, it's all been very informative. So, um, you know, I want to thank you both uh, for participating in this conversation today. And again, you know, as as Joe said, John, thank you for preserving these pieces. You know, they could have easily been lost, literally, to the trash bin. Um, but you know, these mm -hmm. are this is this is real history. So, um, again, everybody, visit ha.com/slash four nine one five five. Place your bids now by the power of Grayskull. <laughs> yes. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having us.